The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee, and a large crowd followed him, because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. He went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish feast of Passover was near. When Jesus raised his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, Where can we buy enough food for them to eat? He said this to test him, because he knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred days' wages worth of food would not be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what good are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people recline. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place, so the men reclined, about 5,000 in number. When Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. When they'd had their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the fragments left over, so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled twelve wicker, bas wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been more than they could eat. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this is truly the prophet, the one who is to come into the world. Since Jesus knew they were going to come and carry him off to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain alone. The Gospel of the Lord. So I've often wondered if people ever sometimes sit out there and think maybe we are with Christ Jesus in the best dressed calisthenics class. Because I'm sure from the outside looking in, or maybe, me, maybe even many of us who are here, our routine sit down, stand, kneel, sit down, stand, kneel, up, down, squat, bend, move can seem just like Catholic exercises, right? We may not understand like why are we doing this now? Oh my gosh. You know, we're wearing holes in the floor from where the kneelers go. We're always constantly moving. Why? Is it because the church wants us to be healthy? We do, but that's not why. Right. So we'll take a look just at that to kind of help us understand exactly what is the church doing with her actions. Because our actions are going to be directed at something. So we'll start with Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, which Latin literally means the law of praying is the law of believing. How we pray will directly affect our belief. The method of our prayer can alter the heart alter the mind, direct it to where it's supposed to go. And so the church in a very specific manner has instituted how we pray, and we've been doing it for 2,000 years to make sure that we're directed in one location and one location only. The Eucharistic Lord, our Savior Christ Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, in the tabernacle and made present on the altar. He is the foundation of our belief and the only direction our prayers should ever be offered. Jesus has been so concerned about this, so concerned that he is our food, that he is our Savior, that he's been feeding us since before he was even born into humanity. In 2 Kings, we hear that God's people were starving, so God wanted to feed them. Physically and spiritually, he fed them so much so they had leftovers. They were starving again in the gospel, more so than what they realized. Starving not just physically, but spiritually. And what does God do? He feeds them. We too come into this church hungry, hungry for things we don't even realize sometimes. And God desires to feed us in the mere appearance of bread, in the mere appearance of wine. He gives us the nourishment we need to go forth into this world, to become good Christian souls, to persevere to the end, to the kingdom of heaven. We are fed at this Mass in the very word proclaimed, but most explicitly in the very Eucharist we receive. And that teaching is hard to understand. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around how God could humble himself so much so that he chooses to appear as bread and wine, but isn't. The essence has been changed. What are we saying? The soul of the bread and the wine is no longer there. It's Jesus. 
You know, if the soul of Matthew was switched with Deacon Dixon, then this would be Deacon Dixon and that would be Father Matthew. But if I lost all of my hair, like the bishop, I'd still be Father Matthew. It wouldn't have changed. So Christ Jesus assumes what we call the accidents, the mere appearances like the hair of what he's taking on, the very Holy Communion we receive. But it's no longer bread and wine. He chooses that out of humility so it's easier for us to accept him. So it's easy for, easier for us to be fed by him. But that also makes it challenging. Challenging to truly believe that what we are receiving is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. It is a person. It is not an it, a bread or a wine, but a person, a very person. We even hear in Mark 24, or excuse me, in Mark 9, verse 24, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help me to believe. And the church desires that too. She wants us to be able to believe. She wants to help us to do that. And so she directs our prayers, lex orandi, lex credendi, how we pray to lead us to how we believe. So she governs the liturgy and teaches since the Council of Trent and into the Second Vatican Council that any priest or layperson who dares to abstract from or change the sacred liturgy constitutes a grave and mortal sin because we're saying we're somehow better than Christ and we're directing our prayers toward a person, not to Jesus. That's why in Mass it's all focused on the tabernacle, on the altar, where Christ Jesus dwells and is made present for us. It's all about that. And because of this, the church offers a number of specific things in prayer for us to help focus. Obviously, we have Eucharistic adoration, right? The adoring of the very body, soul, and divinity of Christ Jesus in the tabernacle, regular adoration. He's sitting there waiting for us. In fact, Jose Maria says, when we approach the tabernacle in church, we need to remember that He's been waiting for us for 20 centuries by name, just for us to sit with him, to be with him. Obviously, the next position, where the Blessed Sacrament is exposed in the monstrance, which, by the way, is from 6 to 9 every Thursday at St. Pat's, where we're able to look upon the face of the one who loved us first, of the one who wants to feed us and bathe in that manner. But our demeanor is most regularly governed at Mass, and that's what we experience the most often, right? And maybe where some confusion comes. So I, I do kind of want to look at that. Um, First off, silence. Why silence? Why silence before Mass? You know, you go over to, like, our friends at the Berean Church, and it's very loud in their church. They're all talking to one another. And it is community-oriented, right? But what, what's missing? Their ability to talk to God before they start the sacrifice. Their ability to say, I'm here. To hear Him say, I love you. Thank you for being here. And at St. Pat's, we beautifully respect that silence. It's delightful. It really is. To come in and, and be able to witness that some people are able just to sit here and be with Christ. And for some, that's the only bit of silence they get the whole week. And especially when you're raising kids, right? We know that can be very difficult and sometimes loud. Sometimes for folks, this is the only bit they get to spend with Christ Jesus in that peace and silence. Which is why Pope St. John Paul the Great said, it's always good to show up to Mass early. To allow yourself to be able to hear God say, I love you. But then when we enter the pew, we have that genuflection, if we're physically capable, right? Obviously, if we're not physically capable, there's some exemptions there. But why a genuflection? Why? Well, since the dawn of the Roman Empire and into the medieval ages, what did a genuflection do? When a knight or a Roman soldier would be carrying their sword, it would always be on their left side, yeah? Because they made everyone be right-handed. There was discrimination against the left. So you had to be right-handed, so your sword was here. So when you went before your emperor or your king and you knelt down your sword was rammed into the ground and shoved back, meaning you couldn't, what? you couldn't pull it out. You couldn't threaten the king in any way, shape, or form. But where was your head placed? Level with his sword. He could decapitate you at any minute. Maybe you've heard the Protestant song, the Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone. Very beautiful song, right? Every move that I make, Lord, have your way in me. They sing that because they don't have a gesture for it. We do. In our genuflection before the tabernacle and to nothing else, so if there's no tabernacle in a church for some reason, I don't know why there are Catholic churches like that. I don't. I'm sorry. But if you go in there and there's not a tabernacle, we don't genuflect. Why? Because we only genuflect to Christ Jesus to say, I give my all to you, to the one who loved me first. That full genuflection of hitting that knee on the ground, allowing ourselves to be surrendered to Christ Jesus, to give everything we have to that man who's going to give it all right back to us. And then throughout the entire Mass, all of our gestures reflect the same thing. When we sit... We're imitating the very, the very greatness in the Old Testament where the people sat and listened to the prophets. And here's the best one. Proclaimed from this ambo by our lectors and deacons. When we stand, how we're standing in the very resurrection of Christ Jesus and walking with him to the kingdom. 
when we're kneeling, our kneeling in adoration, acting for his mercy and help and humility, saying, here I am, and to hear him say, I am here too. When we bow, I love this, Pope Benedict said, when you bow to Christ Jesus, especially in the creed, when we bow to that, not only are we saying thank you, but we're offering him an embrace. And it's an opportunity to feel that embrace back with us. To embrace Christ Jesus. To embrace the Father. To know that the Spirit's with us. And when we strike our breast, we too imitate the centurion. Saying, I need you in my heart. I need you to be all up in my heart and to fill me with everything that you have. But now the hardest part, please do not throw anything at me. The hardest part in the Catholic Church in the United States is the understanding of why are we standing and holding hands in the Our Father. And I'm not saying you have to stop it. If that's your tradition, we'll let it go for now. But be prepared in the next ten years for that to probably end. Pope Francis has already signaled it. He forbid it in all of Europe. Why? Because that developed when people were not in the church. To pray the Our Father outside of the church and hold hands to be united. But what unites us here in Mass? Better question, who? Us or him? Us or him? That's why if someone doesn't want to hold our hand in the Our Father, please don't reach out and make them. Because they may be wanting to share in that intimate moment of being united with that guy right there. With him and him alone. Alright? That's, that's why. So don't freak out if some folks don't want to do it. If you're doing it, whatever. It's fine. Okay? Thank you for not throwing anything. Lastly, though, I also want to look at something. St. Maximilian Colby said this. It's very beautiful. Uh, when he was reflecting on the feeding of the 5,000 and then reflecting on the institution of the Eucharist in the Gospels, as well as John 6, that beautiful discourse on the Eucharist, He wrote, If angels could be jealous of men and women, they would be so for one reason and one reason only. Think about it. Angels are with God all the time. And they can't sin. But if they could sin and could be jealous, what would they be jealous of? We get Holy Communion. And they don't. We literally get to feed upon the very body of our Savior. And they don't. In fact, Pope Benedict would say we are one step above our guardian angel. Because we become the mobile tabernacle for Christ Jesus in Holy Communion. This is why out of love, when we approach the altar, we should approach that altar with the extreme devotion and God willing even making an act of faith. Lord, I want to believe. I believe in you. Help my unbelief. Help me believe this is truly you. To go all out for Christ Jesus. If we made it into an analogy we could understand, and you had a football team, and you had a guy that showed up for practice and came up, and he was just like, ugh. What would the coach do? Be benched, right? No effort. No umph in it. When we coming up for Holy Communion, God willing, there's an umph, not a slaunter, that says, I'm in for you, Jesus. I'm all in. So we can hear God saying that right back to us. I'm all in. In the same way when the church governs our very reception of communion, she does so not to be a stickler, not to be a, a hard person, but to help us focus our belief on who we're receiving. So like when we nobly receive on the tongue, which is the way the church has, has, has asked for thousands of years, to, to stick the tongue all the way out. If you feel like your tongue's all the way out, it's not. You can go further. Trust me. Okay? But why? Because we're receiving, we're being fed by Christ Jesus as he fed the people in the Gospels, as he fed his disciples at the Last Supper. But also if we receive on the hand, if we make that throne, if we're physically capable, right? Because there are some people that can't. I get that. We're physically capable of making that throne for Christ Jesus to receive him. And then What? Never to grab Adam, to feed ourselves. Never to do that Adam and Eve motion of I feed myself so we take him from the extraordinary minister of communion or from the ordinary minister of communion. But to receive him and to realize he's saying, I'm here for you, I love you. And you're saying amen to me as he's saying amen to everything that we're about. And then we allow ourselves to be fed by him, meaning we consume him immediately in front of the person distributing holy communion. And I know somewhere along the way uh, there was some priest that had taught you should sidestep when receiving communion. Our bishop pointed out that there's a directive from the Vatican, okay, that says when we receive communion, we don't step to the side and then receive. That developed because, unfortunately, we had some priests that just became impatient with the communion line. They wanted to speed it up. So they wanted people out of the way. You're never in my way. You're never in my way. Jesus has all the time in the world for you. So when we receive and we consume immediately in front of the person who's distributing communion to remind ourselves that God is feeding us, we are, God is giving us food for our souls. We're not walking away and feeding ourselves. He's feeding us. He did, loves us so much that he wants us to be filled with all of the grace and all the food we could need throughout the whole week. That's why we have that action. 
That's why the church asks of those things, to remind ourselves that he is the one feeding us. That yes, Father Matthew did the consecration, but was it really Father Matthew? Or Christ Jesus who chose to work through the brokenness and the weakness of a parochial vicar to allow Christ to be made present, to allow us to receive our food. And so we have our lex orandi, lex credendi, that the law of how we are praying and what we're doing should God willing affect our faith, change the way we are. St. Padre Pio, a phenomenal man, wrote this. He said, We must always remain close to the Catholic Church and the directions she gives to our actions, even if we don't fully understand them, because she alone can give us true peace, because the Church alone possesses Christ Jesus contained in every tabernacle in the entire world, the Blessed Sacrament, and He is the true Prince of Peace.